so okay to have the water on it. Sure. Good to... evening and welcome to Freedom is a Constant Struggle with your host, Kilu Nyasha. And uh, today we have a pretty special show for you. Uh, our guests are Charlie Hinton, uh, who is a writer, actist, activist, and solo performer who's been involved with the prison movement since uh, 1975 when he represented the Bay Area Gay Liberation on the San Quentin Six Defense Committee. He's been a member of Haiti Action Committee since 2002 and contributes to their publication, Haiti Solidarity. His most recent article is The Death Plan, the Clint Clintons, Foreign Aid, and NGOs in Haiti. He worked the last 19 years at Inkworks Press a worker-owned and collectively managed printing company in Berkeley that recently closed its doors, leaving him, quote-unquote, retired. Solitary Man is his second solo show after Life with Wish, and with him, all the way from New York City, is Fred Johnson, a jazz music musician and human activist uh, who lives in New York and is going to accompany Charlie in his performance um, that's going to happen in a few minutes, of Solitary Man. So welcome, Fred, and welcome, Charlie. Thank Charlie's you. been here before, and uh, we're delighted to have you all the way from the Big Apple. Oh, thank you for having <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, let's talk about the very serious issue that we are going to um, uh, discuss and... Um, and uh, have an artistic performance to uh, educate our audience about the the uh, the the incredible um, solitary confinement. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word uh, for the incredible expansion of it. The you know, Charlie. Uh, there, like there are 180 to, um, there's 80 to 100,000, I think, uh, is the right figure of um, uh, estimate of people locked up in uh, restricted housing in, in tiny little cells uh, for 22 to 23 hours a day uh, all across this country. Uh, now, California rec uh, recently filed, uh, you know, activists in California recently filed a lawsuit. Will you talk about that, Charlie? Uh, at the time, at the time of the th hunger strike that occurred in 2013, mm -hmm. there were 4,000 people in solitary confinement in California. In California alone, right? And it cost about seventy thousand dollars a year to keep them in solitary. Right. And the regular general population is like fifty thousand a person. So it's $80 million additional per year that California spends just to keep people in solitary. And uh, as a result of uh, lawsuits and the hunger strike, the solitary population fortunately is decreasing. Uh, when I wrote, I wrote Solitary Man, it takes place in November of 2014, which is uh, one year after the hunger strike. And since then, there's been a landmark settlement that just got the final approval right. two weeks ago mm -hmm. that will significantly reduce solitary. We can talk about that right. uh, later. But um, it's, it's uh, just uh, it's a terrible uh, condition. And Fred you know, probably can talk about it better than me. Fred. Well, Have you had some experience? I've had some experience. Um, I was in the California system in, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So it's been a while. You know, I've uh, I've been in other systems, other states. Uh -huh. uh, however, I haven't um, been incarcerated since 1995. Mm -hmm. But uh, the vast majority of my life has been, as we used to say, uh, and doing life on the installment plan. Oh, I know, you know what you uh, mean. State raised from juvenile and so on. So, very common story. And it sure is. I can say so. I've uh, been out of that loop for a while. I can only speak to my experience, which was just, um, I guess, 
internalized suppression, something that I just accepted at mm -hmm. the time that this was what you do, that you were, you would, um, back in the day we used to call it the, the hole, mm -hmm. you know, um, now it's SHUs. Security housing units. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, shoe. um, the shoe. <clears throat> So I think that the work that people are doing, that Charlie and others are doing, is, is fantastic. Um, and I have to say, to be quite frank, um, I was doing work in other areas. I didn't want to deal with, I think this is what happens to a lot of us, I didn't want to deal with um, the whole issue of, of being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to distance myself, which I couldn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But that was, I think, that is a that is a concern that, and it's understandable because it's traumatic for many people. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, so um, knowing Charlie, mm -hmm. you know, I met Charlie through some other other work uh, addressing human uh, rights issues mm -hmm. that I was you know, drawn back into this. So. Right on. Um, well, I'm glad that you've decided to. Uh, become an activist and, and help deal with the problems uh, that cause uh, incarceration. But of course, I'm a prison abolitionist. I don't believe in incarceration. I don't yeah. believe we should lock people in cages. I, I'm serious, uh, seriously uh, an advocate of um, rehabilitation in yes. the full, true sense of the word. You know, not this BS that California uh, you know, declares you know, by adding an, an <laughs> R to CDC, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, yeah. it's just nonsense because nobody's rehabilitated in this state uh, or even in this country that I know of. They're just warehoused or they're slave labor, either one or the other, or they're locked in cages in solitary 22 or three hours a day. And uh, unfortunately, that has become the mental health program for mentally disturbed uh, mm -hmm. uh, Americans <laughs> or mm -hmm. people living in America because um, that's what they do. Uh, they lock you up if you act out because you're mentally ill and your behavior is different or erratic, then, a, then you get solitary, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the new mental health uh, institution. Right. And uh, it's ridiculous. Um, it's really obscene. Uh, one thing that uh, just I can't, I, I have to laugh in a kind of surreal way every time I hear it, that one of the conditions caused by solitary is uncontrollable anger. And once these guys and women get out of solitary and start getting some rehabilitation programming, one of the first programs they're in is anger management. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, of course, I mean, <laughs> but they, you know, and they have every right to be angry. They have every right. Because uh, the UN Rapporteur that was here uh, um, several years back uh, declared that um, more than 15 days in solitary confinement is torture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More than 15 days, and of course we know Hugo Pinel, for example, spent 46 years. 46 years. They kept him 46 years yeah. in solitary confinement. And he's exceptional because he's amazingly they couldn't break him and he didn't they didn't drive him nuts. But I'm sure he suffered some damage, you know. Well, in California, 500 prisoners have been in solitary for more than 10 years and 78 more than 20 years. Right. So Which is so, so nasty. Long, it is. It's really nasty. And and it's a struggle for you know like we'll hear in the show. It's really a struggle for survive for sanity. And they're aware of that. Oh, yeah. And, and they, they work to maintain sanity. That's of course. Well, this might be a good time for you to, to give uh, our audience this our very thing? special treat. Okay, thank you. Uh, so performing Solitary Man. This is the first 25 minutes. There's a second part right. two. There's a, this is a Saturday visit day, and then there's a Sunday visit day that follows. So we okay, won't we, won't, we don't have the time to do the do whole that, performance, right. but you'll just have to go see the full performance and what uh, what live uh, um, well we're just moving a little closer there we go and uh, 
I'm driving north on Highway 101 on my way to Crescent City near the Oregon border. This is such a beautiful drive. I just passed Eureka. To my right, there's mountains covered with spruce and behind them, giant redwoods. To my left, the Pacific Ocean gleams in the hot sun. I enter a valley. Cars are stopped up ahead. A herd of elk are crossing the road. I take out my new cell phone and snap photos. It's all ocean and trees the last 40 miles. So beautiful, makes me glad to be alive and relatively free. I'm on my way to Pelican Bay State Prison. I enter the town past beachfront motels, gas stations, the usual trappings of a tourist stop. I check in at the local Econo Lodge, have a Mexican dinner across the street at Toretto's, go back, check email, set the alarm, brush my teeth, and crash. It's a long drive from San Francisco to Crescent City. I visited other prisons before, even death row at San Quentin back in the day when you visited in a great big room like a high school cafeteria filled with convicted murderers and their families all dressed up in Sunday best, eating vending machine popcorn and taking photos in front of a tropical backdrop. Now all the visits are on phones behind glass for high security. I wake up before the alarm goes off, get dressed, and head out to the prison. I'm here to visit Otis Washington. I first heard about Otis during the 60-day hunger strike that started in July of 2013. I wrote letters of support to a number of men that prison authorities had designated as leaders and placed in the most restrictive form of confinement called administrative segregation, where they take away everything, your radio, TV, and all your reading material. A number of them wrote me back, and one of them wrote, Mr. Hinton, I give you the name of another prisoner, Otis Washington, who doesn't get a lot of mail. He's a real positive, upbeat individual with a positive drive to rebuild our communities, and he's participated in all the hunger strikes since 2011. Mail from the outside world would help keep him inspired. Take care. So I write Otis, he answers me back, and our correspondence begins. Thank you for sending light into this dreary reality. I'm 64 years of age, African, born in New York City. When I was five, my mother stabbed my father, protecting me from his abuse. She went to prison, and I began my life in the streets. She finally got out, but I was already smoking weed and drinking. I started shoplifting at 12 and was arrested for the first time at 13. Three years later, I was sitting on the corner of St. Mark's Place and 2nd Avenue with two friends when a pickup pulls up. The driver asks, would anybody like to go to California? We look at each other. Hell yes! We jump in the back and made it to Pittsburgh before the truck broke down. I called my mother and told her I wouldn't be coming home. I never talked to her again. I never saw her again. We hitchhiked all the way to San Francisco with a few nights in jail along the way. I loved it in San Fran. I was selling drugs but also trying to get clean at the time. I had a fight with one of my suppliers and long story short, he ended up dead. That was in 1975. I've been locked up ever since, first at San Quentin, and in this wretched environment ever since it opened in 1989. I've never had a visit from my family. I only have a sister and we're not close. I may get lucky from time to time and someone will write for a minute, but I never allow myself to become too immersed. This protects me from experiencing disappointments and. I've had plenty. There are people who say they have no regrets in life. If they had to do it all over again, they wouldn't change a thing. Well, I'm just the opposite. Ignorance guided me to this present predicament. Over the decades, 
I've worked hard to better myself and recover from my raggedy past. But at times, I feel this huge void. I survive these troubled waters as best I can and sustain myself as best I can. Your correspondence has greatly helped me stay afloat. Thank you. So I write Otis to ask if he'd like a, a visit. He sends me a form, and now I'm almost here. I turn right onto Lake Earl Drive and pass several miles of well-kept suburban homes with big lawns. Tourism and the prison industry make Crescent City a pretty prosperous little town. You might ask, why would a man like me be visiting maximum security prisoners? It started for me in 1975 when I was a member of an organization called Bay Area Gay Liberation. The idea of liberation is that no one is free until all of us are free in the sense of freedom from injustice. It was the time of the trial of the San Quentin Six, six men accused of killing three guards and two other prisoners at San Quentin during the uprising on August 21st, 1971, triggered by the escape attempt, possibly engineered by prison officials, a famous revolutionary prison writer, George Jackson, who somehow found himself with a gun, possibly supplied by guards, who shot him to death. The six poor black and brown men were tried in chains in almost entirely white and wealthy Marin County. The trial lasted for 16 months, the longest in California history up to that time. Three of the six were acquitted of all charges. I went to court and I saw the chains for myself. Mm -hmm. They seemed so unnecessary, like they were meant just to scare the jury and the public. The police had plenty of weapons in the courtroom to protect people. It changed me forever. I got involved with the San Quentin Sixth Defense Committee and I've stayed active around prison matters ever since. A certain San Francisco Chronicle columnist might even call me part of the knee-jerk prison groupie crowd. A fence appears on my right, goes on for a couple of blocks. I come to a stoplight. I look to my right. There's the entrance. I turn into the prison, show my ID at the guardhouse, and drive in. To my left, the forest comes almost all the way up to the road. This place is carved out of a forest. An egret zooms out of the woods almost all the way up to the road, then turns around and disappears into the foliage. I look to my right. Behind two rows of razor wire fence, there's this hideous jumble of concrete warehouses going at all angles, like a rabbit's warren or super Walmarts embedded in concrete. Everything is gray, concrete, steel, sterile, nothing green or growing anywhere. Construction companies must make a lot of money off prisons. I park in the visitor's lot and take my cell phone out of my pocket. I don't bring much. I can only take in my car key along with ID, dollar bills and quarters and a see-through plastic bag. The Ziploc must make a lot of money off prisons. Last time I had pennies in my pocket, which the guards confiscated on my way in because they couldn't be used in vending machines. <laughs> I wonder what it'll be this time. I walk into the lobby. Almost everyone is black or brown. Most are driven from Southern California and some even the 850 miles from the Mexican to the Oregon border to visit for three hours on Saturday three hours on Sunday, then turn around and drive back home. Gasoline companies must make a fortune mm. on prisons. I fill out the visitor's form and turn it into a guard. After a while, another guard calls my name and hands me a pass with Otis's name and number on it and the distorted photo of a dark-skinned, kind of pudgy black man with a short afro. The woman in front of me is having trouble getting to the metal detector. I put my few things in the tray and pass through. The alarm sounds. The guard says, this one's a lot more sensitive than the one they use in airports. It's the button on your jeans. Roll your button into your jeans as far as you can, then walk through sideways, real slow. 
I walk through slower than a Zen walking meditation and make it through to the other side. Another guard stamps my wrist with invisible ink. A gate opens, <clears throat> and we leave the building in groups of seven. The gate closes behind us, and we're fenced into a pen. The gate opens in front, and we walk to a van that drives us to the security housing unit area. All the buildings are concrete. No windows anywhere. Mm -hmm. We arrive. I hand my pass to a guard who assigns me to a stall. I walk up to the window and see a light-skinned, lean and muscular black man with a shaved head. He doesn't look anything like the photo on the pass. I pick up the phone. Otis? That's me. It's Charlie. Charlie, I thought it might be you. He's dressed in a white denim work shirt. He wrote that he's six foot one and before the hunger strike weighed 185 pounds. Didn't they tell you I was coming? They told me this morning I had a visitor, but not who. Thanks for coming all this way. You're welcome. I'm glad to finally meet you. I actually kind of like visiting prisons. <laughs> You're crazy, Charlie, but please stay that way. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming all this way to visit. What's this place like? Well, how can I describe it? They keep us locked up for at least 22 and a half hours a day in these tiny cells. They have eight of them stacked four over four in what they call a pod. They put prisoners totally hostile to each other in the same pod, which only increases our isolation. They have the toilets at the front of the cell so we can't even take a shit without the guards watching us. There are no windows. We never see sunlight. There's no phone calls, no contact visits. We're alone 22 and a half hours a day. How do you stay sane? They try to demoralize the most resolute one of us into folding, become some kind of feeble species with no relevance, even to ourselves. But how do you survive? Discipline. I keep a routine. I do the things I need to do to keep it together. Exercise every day, drink plenty of water, Get plenty of sleep, then just listen to the silence. There's a lot of that. I read a lot. I've always liked westerns. Westerns? Yeah, they were all over San Quentin when I got there. Then the brothers there turned me on to more political material, but I'll read anything. I study the dictionary every day, at least one new word. It's the best I can do living in this foul situation with zero opportunities. The mind has to be challenged each day. And knowledge keeps me with a glimmer of hope. If I can put in 10 hours of constructive activity, I feel like I can make it through the day having saturated my brain with some fat. <laughs> I don't think I put in 10 hours of constructive activity most days at home. I love exercising. I'm in pretty decent physical condition, not to boast or anything, but I take my health and being in prison all these years seriously. I do push-ups, running in place, isometrics. I make a weight by rolling up my mattress and tying it together with a sheet. I have other weights I made by taping together stacks of paper. Well, that's pretty creative. Prisoners can be very creative. I can't do any push-ups anymore because of my torn rotator cuffs. 
What was it like during the hunger strike? Well, we had 30,000 people the first day, so it felt great. Like we were finally doing something worthwhile with our time. But it got tough. I did 20 days before my hypertension kicked in. I was off my medication. Some people went 59 days. It took weeks to gain my strength back, but I'm alive and ready for the next round. I'm glad it's over. Did anybody force you to do it? No. It was all about politicizing the prisoners. Unite as a class, despite our differences, and use our collective energy to get released from this hellhole. There have been three now, right? Two in 2011, then the big one in 2013. Yes, but there were others before that. Have they had any effect? Some. After the second one in 2011, CDCR. CDCR is the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation that oversees all the prisons in California. agreed to review the gang affiliation label of all the prisoners in the security housing units, what they call SHUs or SHUs, and we call solitary confinement. That's helping a lot of guys transfer out of here to general population. We can now take correspondence courses if we had the money to pay for them. Before, SHU prisoners weren't allowed access to any education at all. You still need thousands of dollars for college classes or you'll end up as uneducated and as unemployable as when you first arrived. Haven't they changed the visiting hours? Yes, we can now visit for three hours. Before it was just two. We can now have handballs and pull-up bars, typewriters and calendars. Many of these changes are meant to keep us pacified. But we SHU prisoners are getting along better. Since it was gang violence that led to the creation of these shoes in the first place, we figured the only way to get rid of them was to stop the fighting. So in 2012, 16 men here, the Short Corridor Collective and the representative's body signed a truce agreement to end hostilities that created enough unity among the different ethnic groups for the 2013 hunger strike to take place, and it's still basically holding. Gangs are not an easy subject. Almost all the prisoners in SHU are there because they've been gang validated, either as members or as so-called associates. CDCR claims that the gang leaders forced their members to hunger strike so that the leaders could be transferred to general population. How did you get gang validated? It was political. I arrived here in 1975. That was the year of the San Quentin Six trial. Did you ever hear of them? Yeah, that was my introduction to all this. Well, mine too. The brothers here were all about educating us new prisoners, you know, mentoring us. They used to segregate by ethnicity in those days. We'd have these big gang fights in the yard with prison-made weapons, speaking of creativity. There was a big fight in 1982. A man got killed, and as a result, I was labeled a member of a particular group that prison authorities designated as a gang. You had to stick together in those days. They put me in the adjustment center at San Quentin, and I've been in solitary confinement ever since, more than 30 years. I would love to shake your hand, Charlie, but... 
I haven't touched another human being since I got here. Oh my goodness. I don't know what to say to that. May I ask you a personal question? Sure. You know, all this talk about rape in prison, is there any of that here? Any sexual contact at all? There's no rape here. There's no contact in isolation. I can't describe the deprivation. It's like torture. Humans are social beings. Captivity and isolation put us into conflict with our basic functions and needs. I try to divert my areas of concentration, but <laughs> I'm never far from the thought. Periodically, I'll travel through the depths of my imagination and go to some desert island of the mind with a beautiful woman and find the reservoir for relief. It can get tedious, but living in this abysmal environment, I have to make it work somehow. But I stay in my solitary world. I try to stay positive, Charlie, to help relieve the stress and to keep from going stir crazy. But long periods of sensory deprivation create disequilibrium. You hear what I'm saying? You can't find that balance just by closing your eyes. I did some research before I came. His cell is seven foot seven by 11 foot seven. My little bedroom is eight by nine and a half. Sometimes I think what it must be like never to be able to leave my bedroom, not even to go to the bathroom. I'd say I live vicariously through the lives of others. It's just a way of coping. I study politics. I follow sports. I love theater. I watch that and all kinds of music and nature programs on PBS. I remember those jazz clubs in San Francisco. I would love to get back there again someday. I enjoy hearing about your trips and the movies you see. You do? I never know what to write. Whether you want to know about life on the outside or whether it's just too painful. Charlie, prisons are pathological incubators for the diseased mind. Having contact with the outside world, knowing what's going on, your letters help keep me sane. Hopefully someday I can get out of this place and breathe fresh air again, clear my mind. I guess I should count my blessings to still be alive and half normal. And I count my blessings to be able to get in my car, drive back to San Francisco and have a regular life. I don't know, Charlie. I search for spiritual guidance I pray for the strength to keep on going. Despite my confinement, I still try to lead a purposeful life, to be fair and honest and ethical. The guard comes in and says our time is up. He returns my pass, which I hold up to the glass for Otis to see. <laughs> that photo was taken a long time ago, before I got into shape. I've never been that dark, but my skin hasn't felt sunlight for 25 years. That's what happens. The guard signals us to leave. Bye, Otis. I've had a really good time. Should I come back tomorrow? Yes, please. I'm counting on it. Thanks again for coming all this way. We hang up the phones, hold our hands up to the glass together to say goodbye. The guard unlocks his phone booth cage, handcuffs him behind his back, and returns him to his cell. I walk out into the bright sunlight. I can't bear to go back to the motel. 
I drive to the Good Harvest Cafe and have a big Cobb salad for lunch. I get back in my car, head south, and turn right onto Emmert's Beach Road. I drive to the end, park, get out, and walk along a path to my left that follows a stream. Tall ferns grow from the banks on both sides. The water glistens in the sunlight. It's so beautiful. I look up at the sky. I've never appreciated sunlight quite so much. I walk down to a small beach and watch the waves crash over the rocks. Otis and his fellow prisoners can never see this. Isn't beauty supposed to soften the soul? Are we really making better people by keeping them locked up in these tiny concrete and steel cages? Wonderful. <laughs> I'm not very good at clapping. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, yeah. Oh, that was so good and so poignant. I'm just Thank you. beautiful, beautifully done. Yeah. The other part the, must be really good too. So, <laughs> of course, I've gotten a. Have you I seen? You, so, you, I've see, seen you saw it. I saw the yeah, other one. Yeah. yeah it it, it is really good, folks. <laughs> so Tuesday night, may I ask for Oh, yes, of course. So I have two performances coming up. Uh, the first one is this Tuesday night, uh, may, uh, February 20. The 23rd of every month is a protest against solitary confinement because people are locked up 22 and a half hours a day. So my goal is to do it the 23rd of every month somewhere. All so right. in Jan January, we did it in Oakland. In February 22nd, February 23rd, next Tuesday, we're doing it at 518 Valencia at the Eric Quesada Center at Freedom Archives at 7 o'clock with Fred. And then uh, on March 23rd, I've been invited to perform as part of the Marsh Rising series at the Marsh Theater in San Francisco. Wow. And that'll be at 7.30 on Wednesday, March 23rd. Right, that's my brother's birthday. Yeah. And then uh, I'll be in New York in... June, in the second weekend in June, so looking forward to going there. Wow, and whereabouts in New York? It'll be at a private home oh. with a big parlor and a lot of people invited. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's gonna be great. I hope. Oh, Charlie, that's <laughs> wonderful. And Fred, thank you both so much for that. Thank you, yes. thank you for Yeah, me. that's great. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the facts on the ground. Well, th uh, this was written in 2004. It takes place in November of 2014. And since then, two important things have happened in relation. One is very good and one is very bad. Mm -hmm. The very good is that um, there was a suit filed against uh, California f for indefinite solitary confinement. Right. And uh, instead of going to trial, the state settled it. 
and the final settlement was announced just last week. And so now that and placement in solitary confinement is limited to the number of time, uh, the amount of time a person can be confined. Right. You cannot have indefinite solitary confinement. You have to have a definite amount of time. And it's, I think, not more than a year or something, maybe two. And the other really important aspect is that you don't go anymore for what's called uh, status-based. Like they cannot declare you a member of a gang and put you in a solitary for 25 years because you're identified as a member of a particular gang. Oh. So now it has to be behavior-based oh, in so prison. it's not gang validation it's anymore. Not val no, it's not gang validation anymore. Well, it has to be, that's a real break. It has to be behavior-based of what you actually do in prison that right. would get, that would like killing another a guard or another prisoner or something, might get you into shoe. But it's uh, significantly reduced. But there was another suit filed uh, called the, uh, I forget the name of it. And it was declared, because of the 50% of, of all the suicides in California prisons occur in security housing units that it mandates the guards to check regularly that people are okay. So what they've done at Pelican Bay is carry this to an extreme. Right, I heard about it. And they are, doing, they are doing cell checks every 30 minutes by ringing buzzers, by taking batons and banging them across the, the doors of the cells. And because of the construction of Pelican Bay, it just becomes like this giant echo chamber. And it started August 2nd, so it's more than six months now this has been going on. And there's an active campaign. Uh, people can go to the Prisoner Hunger Solidarity, uh, uh, Prisoner Hunger Solidarity uh, website, and PHSS website, and get an action alert about all the officials to call and the 23rd of every month is a day of protest against solitary. So we ask people to call and write an email on the 23rd of every month at least to protest the sleep deprivation that's going on because sleep deprivation is one of the definitions of torture. Of course it is. Imagine being making, waking up every half hour. And, of course, I've seen uh, documented documentaries uh, about sleep deprivation and, you know, and they studies that have been done and it, it can wreck you. It's one of the tortures used at Guantanamo. Yeah. So, so the CDCR, you know, they're definitely feeling something because they set, they made this settlement. But now the sleep deprivation is just a retaliation. Right. How do you, how did we prevent the guards from retaliating against the right. prisoners? And that doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be an answer to that. And we also and have they're very talk about how powerful the guards union is. Well, I, I wanted to say well also that we we have word now that the sleep deprivation is happening happening on women's death row, and we're we're working to document that. And uh, a woman will be going to the uh, California prison for women this weekend to get more information about that. But where is the women's death? Chowchilla. Chowchilla. Okay. Chowchilla. I mean, what was your question? Um, I, now it escaped. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember? Oh, no. Oh, the, oh, the, the, uh, the prison guard. The oh, how powerful, oh, the, how powerful the, prison the prison guard, guard union, union is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank it's you. the most powerful union in California. There's a movement in the FFLCIO to uh, make prison guard and police unions separate or, or not let them be part of it because so much of what they do is counter to the work of you know, the union movement. And uh, the start, a, a guard in California prison starts at $60,000 uh, 60, a year. You know, somebody straight out of, out of uh, the training, which uh, doesn't take that long, starts at $60,000 a year. What's and What's the credential, high school diploma? Mm, well, yeah, a lot of them come out of the military mm -hmm. into it. Right. And they don't vet for uh, racism, for sa sadism. Of course not. And other but uh, <laughs> also, uh, I remember uh, several years back, um, 
the, the local newspaper cited the, uh, the highest paid state official in, the s in California, and it wasn't the governor. It was a lieutenant um, prison guard. Wow. And uh, it, it, it pointed out it was a couple hundred thousand dollars um, that he had earned in a year. And um, the, uh, a lot of prison guards were earning like $100,000 a year uh, because of overtime. Right. Well, there are more whatnot. than that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, that was the average. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's, it's just amazing um, that people can actually get high st highly paid to brutalize and repress and And prisoners. it's increasingly women. I mean, the two, the two guards that I've heard about recently from prisoners are both women, the, mo the most violent towards the prisoners. Well, <laughs> so females can be reactionary know, too and violent and brutal. We know that, I mean. But it's just and reactionary. I, it's, it's just a yeah, sad concept. Yeah, <laughs> which is why we shouldn't vote for a president just because of, a, of gender. Gender. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there's a new head of CDCR now. Uh, I think uh, the old one, Beard, left or retired. And it's good that he's gone because he was terrible. And he really uh, did everything he could to uh, create negative media during the hunger strike and not respond to the demands of the prisoners. The, the hunger strike was based around five core demands that they're still demanding. But uh, And what were those? Well, the settlement is, 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 is number one, an end to indefinite solitary confinement. Right. So that is a huge victory. Uh -huh. And uh, one of them is about food. One of them is about educational opportunities. Uh, one of them is more access to outside. I think I, I don't remember exactly all five, but but I know food and um, and activities were two of them, and the and then the end of indefinite solitary. Oh, one and that that it be behavior based, and not Gang status related. based. Yeah, as okay. I say. Okay, Fred, um, talk a little bit about your experience and what it was like being locked up and then what it, what it felt like getting out. Well, we were talking about that last night. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, the first thing that comes to mind is internalized oppression. Mm -hmm. When, and what I mean by that, I know that's broad, is that for a lot of us, and speaking for myself, growing up in institutions, you almost feel like, well, this is the way it's supposed to be. Right. Yeah. This is the way it's supposed to be. And you become institutionalized. You become institutionalized, um, and you don't let them break you. So that was your whole purpose in life. Don't let them break you. But you keep going back, and you don't understand why. Right. Well, they've got and it set up for you. Yeah. Um, I think I was telling Charlie the, the other day the first uh, the first job I had. I was 45 years old. I'm 65 now. And um, that is, you know, as a result of of just having enough. You know, having enough. You know, uh, abusing myself, uh, being a part of this system. You know, I took time, something happened, and, and I said, well, you know, all of the brothers and sisters who are still locked up, who, who um, are dead, who didn't make it, you know, it gets, get, at least gave me the opportunity to be in the streets right. more time. So it came a point where I said, well, this is it. This is it for me. I didn't tell anybody. It's just my last bid was in another state. It was just that this is it. I know I'm going to do something with my life. I don't know what it's going to be. And I got into different things. Uh, one main thing was uh, uh, needle exchange, syringe access, HIV prevention. Good, yeah. Um, among other things. 
And a lot of that, it was just based on my history of being, my life experience, being incarcerated. Um, transferable skills, as they say. I tried to, uh, I read a lot. Uh, so I, I use that. Right. I don't have a degree. Me either. Right. However, I, I did, like to you study. Know, yeah, I mean, I like to study, and as a result, I became, you know, executive director of a few programs, travel the world, et cetera, et cetera. All right. You know, um, so even though it was experienced, well, I don't know, most of it was negative, but you can, you can with support. Yeah, you can redeem support. yourself, you can with support. change your life, you with can support. turn it around with support. and move and forward. I just keep saying that, yeah, right on. with the support of people. Yeah, yeah, we do have to support each other and, and that's because there's no support coming from the, any of these states when prisoners are released. There's just no there's support no, for no them, support. none. So, I mean, so to me, that's, that's uh, so many of us didn't make it. I know. And are still there and forgotten about, and that, that has to change. Yes, we got a free clip. We got one minute left. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Fred Johnson. Thank you, Definitely. Charlie Hinton. And uh, thank uh, Sydney Madison for a terrific job uh, hooking this all up. I appreciate thank it you. so much. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Freedom is a Constant Struggle. I'm your host and producer, Kidu Nyasha. Be sure to tune in. Uh, when is the next program? Uh, this is m March 3rd. <laughs> We're on the 1st and third Thursdays of the month. And we're streamed and uh, we're repeated uh, on Channel 29 every Wednesday. So all power to the people, free all political prisoners, and uh, vencedemos. Vencedemos. <laughs>